awesome God. Oh, somebody worship right there. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord, in these places. We worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. I just dare you to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah, we give you praise. We honor you this morning, oh Lord. We honor you this morning. Saints of God, with the fruit of your lip, will you continue to open up your mouths and Hallelujah. give him praise? He is worthy of all of our praise. Can someone shout hallelujah? Can you shout it again, hallelujah? One more time, hallelujah! He is worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Lord. And so now if you would follow me into the Word of God as we go into the book of Hebrews chapter 13. And I want to read this morning verses 8 and 9. I am reading out of the New Living Translation, but if anyone wants to read out loud with me, please do. Let's magnify the Word of God this morning. The Word of God says to us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which don't help those who follow them. I am going to hone in on verse eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I want you to know that that is good news for us. Can you say, I just heard some good news? I'm reminded of the good news that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Father God, we are your people. We are your believers. We've assembled today to give you praise, to hear your word, to offer our worship to you. So I pray now that everything up to this moment has pleased you. And now I decrease so that you can increase, have your way, because now we want to receive from you. This is your word. We are your people. Speak now. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. Praise the Lord. I want you to know I'm running on the inside, and I feel like I need help right now just to stay put. Um, so I'm going to wash my hands and not have them all over the place this morning. Um, God is so good. He's so good. He is so awesome. He's so awesome. Okay, so let me put in context the scripture this morning. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Just that statement alone emphasizes the unchanging nature of Jesus Christ. It's in contrast to the world that we live in that is around us where so much of it is temporal. So much of it is transient. Uh, that's the nature of worldly things and worldly places. So today, as we look at the unchanging nature of Jesus Christ, which some theologians would use the word his immutability, he cannot change. He is the same today, yesterday, today, and forevermore. We live in a world that, it is in, that is in a constant state of flux. Just turn on the news. Just listen to the people who are talking. The world that is in a constant state of flux. 
We live with values shifting and changing, ideologies that change, people that come and go. But there is one constant that we will not change. There is one unchanging reality that we all have, that Jesus is. That's a reality for us. And so throughout, if, we, if you know the book of Hebrews, throughout the book of Hebrews, the writer is consistently contrasting the Old Testament with the New Testament. The New Testament, the New Covenant, I should say, the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, and the New Covenant that, of course, has been established by Jesus Christ. And so today, as he begins to end this letter, he emphasizes the unchanging nature. So therefore, we can find our foundation for our faith, a rock upon which we can anchor, anchor ourselves, our lives, in the midst of everything else changing around us. We can live a life that is anchored, anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I think about this, God doesn't change. Over the ages, he has not changed. Jesus Christ, who is God, has not changed. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's our anchor. So I talk for a moment just who was Jesus yesterday. I, I go straight to John 1 and 1 that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. God in the word was God in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind the light that shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it so think about Jesus Christ he was with God in the beginning through him all things were made without him nothing was made that has been made let me say that again, that through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Ooh, awesome. In the beginning. And, and then I remember Jesus in yesterday. And, and that Jesus, how powerful and how influential that he is, that just his presence was able to divide history in time. That history is now divided between before Christ and in the year of our Lord, which some called Anno Domini. That he was, he split history before Christ and now in the year of the Lord. Powerful. Yesterday, Jesus secured the believer's place in eternity. Yesterday, Jesus showed us what it means to to live to do the will of the Father. Jesus reminded us and showed us that even nature has to bow to God, that God has control over the sun, the moon, the waves, the storm. All of nature bows to the command of God. Jesus modeled compassion. Love walk the earth. He is the judge of the living and the dead. This same Jesus Christ who left his throne to come to be born of a virgin, to live not as a king, but as a carpenter's son. Jesus who is brother, who is friend. Jesus who showed himself as a leader, who was baptized, crucified, and risen. This is the Jesus yesterday, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Jesus the Christ who healed the sick, who miraculously fed the 5,000, who calmed the storm, who walked on water, who cast out demons, who forgives sins, who rose from the dead. I'm talking about Jesus as the deliverer, as the demon slayer, 
as the Savior and lover of our souls. I'm talking about Jesus, the righteous judge, the majestic one, Jesus, the creator, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, this same Jesus who whooped the devil. But wait a minute, don't let me sound too uneducated. No, Jesus, the one who defeated the devil, disarmed his forces. Jesus, the one who bruised his heel, who publicly embarrassed him. Jesus, the one who confused him. And in just a little while, Jesus will throw him into the pit and lock him up for the ages. This is the same Jesus that today we call out his name. Today we call upon his name. This is Jesus, the one yesterday who showed us how to fight, who showed us how to get through our circumstances, who showed us how to confront the enemy. Jesus showed us how to fight. So I come today to remind you, don't be afraid of any man, woman, or child. Don't be afraid of any demon and what they can do to you. I didn't say you won't be tried. I didn't say that you won't be tested. I did not say that trouble won't show up on your door. What I'm saying to you is that Jesus showed us how to fight. He showed us as the story is told as he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. He showed us how to take the word of God, the word that becomes a two-edged sword, the word that can cut. He showed us how to fight. This same Jesus showed us how to stand firm in our faith, how to stand firm in what we believe. He showed us that trouble couldn't stop him. Threats didn't scare him. Death couldn't claim him. And the grave could not contain him. This is the same Jesus that we call upon today. And what the good news is, is that he's not a respecter of persons. If you could go into the word of God, into the book of Acts chapter 4, there's two verses there, 34 and 36, that shows us that Jesus does not discriminate. Peter, who was called to go into the home of Cornelius, which was so significant at this time, Cornelius, Cornelius was a Gentile. In those days, Jews, the Hebrews, did not go and sit or enter the home of the Gentiles. But God has sent a message to Cornelius that Peter was coming. Peter received word from God that you have to go over to Cornelius' house. And so Peter opens his mouth in verse 34 and says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, that God is not a respecter of persons. But in every nation, whoever fears him, and works righteousness is accepted by him. Verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of, e of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. The word is that he is the Lord of all. So God does not discriminate on race, on color, on background. He doesn't discriminate on your resume of sin. He will take your resume of sin and wrap it up and throw it into the sea of forgetfulness. He will forgive you. So it doesn't matter. So it may matter in the world whether you're black or white or red or brown. It doesn't matter to Jesus. He'll take us black, white, red, yellow, brown, blue, or green. And I know someone's trying to figure out who is blue and who is green. I just know God even creates aliens somewhere. They may be blue or green. The point is, he's not a respecter of persons. 
The word of God tells us his grace is available to all. Verse 9 of our text this morning says, so don't be attracted by strange and new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which don't help those who follow them. In other words, we're living in a time where people are coming up with what seemingly seems new. There is a thing that is called new age thinking. There are new ideologies, new ways of values that are shifting here and there. There are new ways that people decide they want to live. But the word of God says, don't be attracted by strange new ideas. I was talking to my daughter the other day and I was listening to an inspirational um, message. And I, I said to her, some days I have to turn off uh, messages. I have to stop listening to people because I go on inspiration overload. Someone may say, how can you be inspired to overload? Because sometimes it's just too many voices, too many people. And, not, and I'm not even saying that what they are saying is not true. I'm just saying I'm already filled up. I'm already taking in so much from the word of God that sometimes hearing so many voices puts me on overload. The thing that I need to know today is that Jesus is the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If I just stop right there, I have enough inspiration in my fuel tank just to keep me going. It says, do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace. I need to be strengthened. His grace, which is his unmerited favor that we do not earn, that is not deserved. I heard another say that God's grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Our strength comes from God's grace. The word says it's not from adhering to a list of rules about food. In the old covenant, there were a lot of rules about food and they were very intentional and committed to following the rules about food. And so he uses that to say, but it didn't help those who follow them. It didn't get you any closer to God just by following rules. No, God intends for us to have a relationship with him. It's not about the rituals and the rules. It's about a relationship where he talks to you, you talk to him. Where you get to know him, he, he knows us and he reveals us to ourselves. So our strength comes from God's Grace, not because you don't eat pork, not because you're not eating chicken and bacon and ham hogs and pork chops and chitlings and pig's feet and pig's tongue and butter, milk, eggs, potato chips, chocolate. That's not where your strength is. Now, I'm not saying it's not good to eliminate that from your body. I'm just saying the strength that you need to live this godly life, the strength that you need to live holy and righteous, the strength that you need to have patience to wait on God, the strength that you need to keep one foot in front of the other, the strength that you need for that comes from God's grace. It is his grace that we have been saved through faith. It is his grace. So when we talk about uh, strength in grace, it is that, that dynamic relationship that we get to have with God, where his grace through the person of the Holy Spirit empowers us, transforms us. It's, rec it's when we recognize that we are dependent on God, that we embrace 
embrace God, that we draw closer to God, and that we allow God to have his way in our lives. Strength in grace is the strength that we need in the inner man. It is the strength that we need to acknowledge that we get weak sometimes. And it's in our weakness that we lean on the power of God. It is in 1 Corinthians 12 and 9 that says God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Strength in grace to live holy. Strength in grace to love your neighbor as yourself. Strength in grace to receive and give forgiveness. It's strength in grace to endure, to persevere, to keep holding on when you don't feel like holding on, but you're holding on because you have the strength and grace to believe God. You have the strength and grace to hope against hope. You have the strength and grace to believe that with just mustard seed faith, you can move the mountain. You can stop standing in front of the mountain and just looking at it. But you have the strength and grace to say, I'm moving this mountain with the faith in God that I have. Faith to stand as a conqueror, strength to, in grace to use your faith to move out of being a victor, a victim to become the victor. I want to know, does anybody know what it means to have victory in Jesus Christ? It is the strength in grace that even when your situation make you feel like you're standing in quicksand, that you're starting to sink. It's when situations make you feel like you have those moments when you're feeling so high that you really do feel like you're walking on water. And then in an instant, you feel like you're about to drown. It is the strength and grace that will pick you up and turn you around. It's the strength in grace that took Joseph from the pit to the palace. It's the strength in grace that gave Daniel victory in the lion's den. It's the strength in grace that gave David the ability to knock down a giant. I love the way it is recorded in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 39 when David is having this conversation with Saul, this young teenage boy that believed that he was big, bad enough, and old enough to kill a giant that everybody else was trembling and so scared of. But it was this little teenage boy that had this testimony. He says, it was the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. He will rescue me from this Philistine. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Someone has to believe that he's still a deliverer. David said he is a deliverer. He delivered me and rescued me. Saul, hearing the testimony of this young teenage boy, says, okay then, okay, I hear you believe, I hear that you know, all right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you. I know some of us have dealt with some giants in our lives. Somebody may be dealing with a giant in your life right now. David was able to knock down the giant with three stones that he had in his bag. I want to give you three things that are with you this morning that I promise you will knock down any giant in your life. Are you ready for the three things? He had three stones. I'll give you the three things that you hold in you that will kill any giant. One, you have the Bible, the Word of God. Two, you you have the name of Jesus Christ. And third, you have the person of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Tell me you can't slay no giant. Tell me you can't deal with the mountains in your life. Tell me you got three things. David killed the giant with three stones. Use the word of God. Use the 
name of Jesus. Believe in the person of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling with you. There is nothing that should be stopping you from imagining your victory. There is nothing that should be stopping you from believing in your victory. There is nothing that should stop you today from proclaiming your victory in Jesus Christ. I need to hear the people of God say, I believe. I believe. I believe. I'm more than a conqueror. I believe the victory is mine in Jesus Christ because he is. Okay, so that was probably about 50% of you. So that means I got to keep on preaching until everybody gets it that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, you must have somewhere to go after church because you're trying to get out of here. Jesus is. Okay, okay. So what has he done for you today? So I talked about all the things Jesus has done yesterday. But if I ask you, what has Jesus done today that you can count on again for tomorrow? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. What is it that Jesus is doing for you today that you can count on again for tomorrow? I'm anchoring your faith this morning. What is it that Jesus has done for you today that you can count on it again tomorrow? So you know me, because I say it a lot, that immediately when I think of what Jesus has done for me today, I think of the blood that is going through my veins. I think of the heart that is beating. And I, and I say to myself, yes, Jesus has done that for me today, but it's not guaranteed that the blood will be flowing through my veins tomorrow. It's not guaranteed that my heart will be pumping blood tomorrow. That that's not guaranteed. So I can't answer that question with that response. What is it that Jesus has, is doing for me today that I can count on again for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, any of us may be elevated into the next realm. Amen. Any of us today may be elevated and transitioned into the presence of Jesus Christ. What is it today that I can count on again for tomorrow? Well, now I, I thought about it long enough, and here's what I came up with. I can count on him today that he is our great high priest. I can count on it today that Jesus is interceding in prayer and glory for us right now. I can count on that no matter where I am, whether I'm on this side or on the other side, that Jesus is still going to be in his position as the great high priest. I can count on that Jesus will always have power and authority. So today I can live in the power and authority of Jesus Christ. If I'm elevated to glory, then still Jesus' power and authority exists there as well. I think about the passion and the commitment that took Jesus to the cross, the love. I can count on that no matter what day, no matter what hour, that Jesus' passion and commitment that led him to redeem us, to save our souls, to secure our place in eternity with him, he'll always have that compassion and commitment to our well-being. There's nothing that will separate us from the love of God. That's for today and that's for tomorrow. Jesus Christ will not only meet our needs today, but he will meet our needs forever and ever, forevermore. 
Jesus meets, met the needs of all the believers yesterday. He's meeting our needs today, and he'll meet our needs tomorrow. Can I get an amen? Do you believe that? Jesus is the source of all life. He is the giver of life today and tomorrow. The same desire God had to dwell with Adam and Eve in the garden is still the same desire he has today to walk with you in the cool of night. He was present with us yesterday. He's present with us today, and he will be present with us tomorrow. We can count on that because Jesus is the same to yesterday, today, and forevermore. So how do you respond to a God who is so committed to you? How do you respond to a God who is so faithful to you? How do you respond to a God that left his place in heaven to come to earth so that you might be redeemed? How do you respond? How do you respond? We respond with our praise. We respond with our worship. We respond and live in spirit and in truth. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We present ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. That's our response. We repent when we fall or when we stumble. We make the affirmation, for you I live and for you I die die. We align our lifestyle with his will and his way. That's a response to a God who is unchangeable, that will be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You know, I heard that if you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck, then it must mean you are a duck. I want to say that if you walk like Christ, if you talk like Christ, if you love like Christ, if you sacrifice like Christ, if you forgive like Christ, then you must be following Christ. And you must be a true and bona fide disciple of Christ. I'll close right here. Because you got it, right? Jesus is. I'll close right here. As Saul said to David, let the Lord be with you. That's what I want you to know. That he was there yesterday, he's there today, he'll be there tomorrow. So that's why I believe you can dream that no matter what is going on around you that is changing, no matter what is around you that is temporary, because he is with you, I say keep on dreaming. That's why I say you can still hope today, because he won't change. That's why I don't even need the title of a, a, a prophetess to tell you your future looks bright. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You just need to get up every day and look like you know who he is. Look like you believe the Lord is with you. So you just need to wake up, get up, put your chin up. Get your back straight and start walking. Start putting one foot in front of the other. You just need to keep it moving. You just need to believe that God is working with you, that God has everything worked out, that God has a plan. And if you're in the plan of God, that all things are turning around for your good, you just need to keep your chin up, keep your back straight, keep your feet moving, keep moving to your destiny. God has something for you. He believes in you. He's trusting you. Don't give up the faith because the same God that 
delivers, that heals. The same God that has all power and authority in his hand. That is the same God that is in you and with you. Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, today, and forevermore. Ooh, Give him ahead. your praise.